fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Joe Goldberg is in the house again. I'm, I'm here for you, Al. I'm here for you. Well, listen, uh, today we've got a returning guest, um, not, not necessarily returning for exactly what he was here last time for. Last time, I believe he was talking about Shadow Masters Reloaded, which is a more of a, um, action suspense thriller type novel. And, um, now, you know, maybe even dark fiction, depending on who you talk to. But now he's decided to, uh, add to his, um, a vast array of books, and now he's got a new one out that's considered ho- horror, and that's Whispers of a Gypsy. So, uh, welcome, JT, and uh, how are you doing? Thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate you having me back, and uh, I am doing well. So, this was for me. This isn't what I expected out of you, because uh, I mean, uh, you know, I've interviewed you, and and we've talked, and all that, and I see you on social media, and that. So I don't, I didn't really notice anything like this coming, and all of a sudden it was here. Um, are a lot of people surprised you did this? I think so, and and I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing or not. Um, I I had finished my, I guess my series that I that I was under contract for of Task Force Orange series, and uh, I finished that right before COVID, and there were some things about the contract I didn't love. I was under still the um, the responsibility to submit all of my work to CIA and DOD, and that takes a lot of time, and it was making it difficult to meet some deadlines for publishing. Um, and there was an aspect of really them just not wanting me to continue on uh, the, the, the subject that I was doing, which was this uh, more of a signals intelligence thing. So about that time during COVID, you know, my son was asking me if he could read any of my books. And, you know, the answer was no, they were just too dark. Language was horrible. And he said, could you write me one? And uh, I said, sure. And so he gave me some of the criteria that um, that he was hoping I could include in a book. And, uh, you know, two years later, it took on a uh, kind of a life of its own. And, uh, you know, out popped this uh, this horror book, and uh, and I thought as while I was writing it, it was really pretty liberating because I no longer had to worry about ammunition, the type of gun, the range, all of that detail, and of course then the the, the regulations you know that I had to work within. It was just you know write the story, and uh, and I, I really enjoyed what I was doing, and and I think it also played to a lot of what I read, which is a lot of Thomas Harris, uh, Stephen King, a little bit more in that. Um, suspense and uh, psychological fiction and, and even horror. Why do you think some people would be not so happy that you've surprised them with this horror? Well, I don't think that it's, you know, a, a, an anger in any really, you know, I'm not a million copy uh, writer either. So it's not like I just disrupted a whole, you know, readership. Um, I think that many of the people who are looking for, specific military thriller and espionage um, could get a little bit annoyed with some of the supernatural aspect in this one, even though it does have some aspect of espionage to it um, and a little bit of the, the military side. So I think that it's really more about the purists uh, that could be like, oh, this isn't really my bag. I wish you wouldn't have done something like that. But again, for the amount of readers that I actually have that are buying books, I don't think that it's anything that's too concerning. Um, but I'm just hoping people recognize it for what it is. That's a specific different group than, uh, or 
series of books than what this new one is. Yeah, I'm sure all five, six readers won't mind. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, but why not use a pseudonym, you know, like a, uh, a different name uh, for this type of book just in case, like just separate it, um, you know, call yourself TJ. You know, you're not too far off. Actually, there was a couple uh, agents and publishers that had recommended that. Um, and I suppose that if I really wanted to just start over, uh, I could do it. But I think in this case, even though it is a separate genre, if you look at some of the books that I had written, still that dark fiction, still that same type of a tone, still that kind of a gray uh, decision-making process, they're really all the same. So I think I was willing to take a bet, you know, roll the dice a little bit on this one and keep the name. Um, because ultimately if I end up moving more into this space or, you know, even shifting around, it's still the same type of work that I'm doing. It's not like I'm writing all of a sudden this, you know, happy young adult or a children's book in a totally different tone. It's still the same pace, the same feelings, that same kind of brooding hanging over cloak, uh, that goes into this writing that I think people are. I think coming to me to read, which is different from any other type of like the military thriller or espionage. So if they like what they're reading with me and they're following me, it could be just because of that type of a tone that I am using in my writing. And and that's what I'm hoping to just continue on because that's, that's me. That's my style. Yeah. I, I, I read it. It's a great book. So you just gave me the similarities. I can, I can see the darkness and we'll get maybe more into the plot and things like that, but it's, you know, it's it's a it's it's heavy. It's dark. It's horror, like the military stuff, the action stuff. What's different? What was different from writing espionage, thriller, action to horror? And how'd you how, how'd you do it? What is your research process or something? I think in this one, it was a lot more about the a um, little bit of a family structure, a little bit more about society. Um, certainly there's, you know, one of the main characters, Dwight, uh, who's a 12 year old child. Um, there is a detective that is, um, uh, a, a person of color and has gone through some, um, social issues herself and that she's trying to deal with and navigate even in this kind of closed Jewish society that she's operating in. So there is a lot more. I don't, want, I don't know that it's necessarily cultural, but there were certain a lot of sensitivities. Um, this book, more than any other book, I had at least a dozen sensitivity readers because it is so vast. It can deal with people of color. It can deal with the Romani, which is what it centers on. You know, we call them gypsies, but, you know, that's a disparaging term. Um, and so to understand, you know, how you can use that appropriately without offending other people. Um, there's the Jewish element and there's a part of it where when you're looking at the conservative Jewish family, how there is an element of some abuse that you, you never hear about. Um, so how you can deal with that without it coming off as anti-Semitic when the whole message is to counter uh, the anti-Semitism and talk about hate. So it's, it's really difficult, I think, um, to navigate some of those things where you want to cast a little bit of light into some areas, but, you know, being an other in almost all of these cases, um, I think it was, it was hard to do. And I think that, you know, the other fine line that I had to walk was about, uh, appropriation, um, uh, misappropriation, you know, and, and taking, um, that voice from people. And so I had to be really sensitive to, you know, be authentic as I could in a storyteller without it really being my story. If that makes sense. Yeah. When you're doing kind of even the other style of book, don't you have to kind of go through the same sort of sensitivities in a way? Cause you're dealing with, you know, with espionage or crime or thrillers and stuff. And you're also involving other countries. I think I worried about it a lot less. Um, I wasn't worried about offending Iran as a country as a whole. Um, you know, when I was talking about some of their uh, military um, actions and things of that nature, I don't think, I think the only thing I had to worry sometimes about was, 
you know, sometimes in military thrillers, you, you often find that a lot of the far right or conservatives um, might go towards those a little bit more than say, you know, far left leaning. And so sometimes you just want to balance that a little bit. If you don't want to get too preachy or you don't want to get too sensitive or too woke, you know, that type of thing. But I, I just always felt like what I wrote was what I wrote. Um, and I didn't worry too, I was more worried about what I couldn't disclose or expose uh, than it was sensitivities of any individuals, groups, peoples, et cetera, as much. Maybe I should have. Well, hey, hey, JT, have you gotten anybody comments back from anybody, positive or negative, hopefully positive, constructive um, on those topics? I would say, so there was, a, there was a, a, a large group of Jewish horror writers that I submitted to first, and they were like, I see nothing wrong with this. Um, and and even because I also wanted to make sure that as there's a very small segment where I actually am describing a part of the concentration camp where some of these experiments were, but I, I tried not to make the book that at all. Uh, so it was just this very sliver to give a little bit of context. And I wanted to make sure that nothing was being exploited for horror sake um, and for shock factor uh, as much as that was just part of the atmosphere in that situation. So I think from that standpoint, but I, I'd say people were really pretty forgiving and, and they, they, they liked that, you know, how it was done because it was being authentic to show there were some really horrific things done. Um, from individuals that had, you know, Romani, Roma backgrounds, um, they thought there are some that didn't like the word gypsy being used in any sense. And I suspect that was part of, you know, just like using the N word, uh, R words, you know, just, there's just kind of a line. But when I, so I actually talked to the um, uh, Auschwitz museum, Poland and a number of people. And I asked, why are you still using the word gypsy? And they said, well, because that's how people are recognizing it. And if we talked about it as Romani, not necessarily the same amount of people would recognize that we're talking about the same group of people. And so when I even went with the title, of whispers of a gypsy, I, you know, I initially had it as whispers of a stranger and the feedback I was getting from publishers and agents were, it's really not very provocative in that we don't know what you're talking about. And so I did consciously make that decision to use it to draw in a little bit more of that awareness. And I, and I hope I did the right thing because again, I don't, anything that anybody said, mm, that's a little, a little iffy, uh, I took out. Um, there was one part about, um, I think there was something in like, uh, some, some jargon I had used and someone's like, that's really not necessary because we already know who this individual is and what's going on. And so we don't want to reinforce something. So that type of stuff was really helpful. I think similar to the, um, sensitivity readers, I, I used about four different editors also. I used one from Berkeley, uh, education. Um, I used one that was uh, a British uh, uh, editor. Then I used somebody that was from horror. Then I actually used a horror writer. So I was getting a whole lot of different perspectives also on language use, structuring the sentence, et cetera, so that I was putting the story together to be representative of everything I was hoping it would be. So it, it took a lot of real engineering, so to speak. Well, talk about that. What is the difference in writing the horror stuff versus your previous books. So stylistically, yeah. So good question, and I think that's um, also an area that I try to be very conscious of. So, I, as much as I'm part of the um, International Thriller Writers Association, I'm also part of the Horror Writers Association, and I've been a juror uh, in the past for their Bram Stoker Award in a number of different categories. So, at any point in time in a year, I'm reading about. 70, 80, maybe 90 books um, to help judge and, and to make the recommendations of the ones that we want to put forward. And I, in reading a number of those and seeing what didn't work, I also tried to engineer what would work. And I felt like to grasp a reader, and this is true of really any book, the first three chapters or four chapters have to be very, very compelling. To, to, to bring them in, you know, now it's what Amazon might provide as a sample. In the past, it could have been at Barnes and Nobles, what you could read in about five minutes. Um, so I tried to construct that very tight so that it was compelling, suspenseful, 
bring the reader in. I think that's very similar to what we do in, in the thriller side. The other aspect of it is I do feel that there, uh, there's a number of different camps in horror as to what people want to see and what they don't want to see and where they usually have the biggest complaints. And the one biggest complaint that I saw was it was a good story, but it took a long time to get into it or it got me into it. And then it kind of petered off. And I thought that what I could bring from the thriller side was a little bit faster pace and tempo. Um, really watching that tempo in the character arcs, even if there were multiple. And I think having a little bit more structure to how that was mechanically put for a thrill ride of having your peaks, having your valleys, having your midpoints and having something else so that you're leaving almost each chapter as a cliffhanger. Um, I felt that that was very, very helpful. And as I see a lot of horror writers today, there are, you know, those that are writing more about those haunted houses and there's some that are about the vampires. And I find that a lot of the writing can be very, very casual. Let's kind of see where it goes. I'm not sure how many are really structuring uh, their novels to really understand where they have the reader, where they need to keep the reader, where they can let them go, where they don't need so much exposition. And I think so a lot of lessons learned from both the genres and then both as reading just a massive amount and recognizing, okay, what's going to get you know, brought forward for an award and which are those that are kicked to the curb. So what is the basic premise of this book? So in this book, what we have is there's a um, Mr. Mortimer is the, uh, he's the, I, I don't know that he's necessarily the, he's definitely the anti-hero and uh, he has been, um, he was he was a victim of the the Holocaust uh, and and a lot of genetic testing. Um, I guess we might look at it from that superhuman standpoint. Um, he was exploited to uh, hunt Nazis, and I don't without giving too much away. Um, that's part of you know his job, but but w- that's not the premise of the book so much as like he's finishing that now. He's his, he's done his duty seventy five years later. You know, most of the Nazis are gone. Um, how is he going to live his life? And through, you know, a happenstance situation, um, he's brought in with his family that he has some blood ties to from the Romani community and, uh, and found, finds his boy, um, who's uh, mentally challenged. Um, his, his, his mom's being abused. He's being abused. Uh, and he becomes a bit of a protector. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, Mr. Mortimer's past is catching up to him. Secrets are being divulged. And so those kind of come crashing in. So he's having to both protect himself and then also this boy. And I think what we see is just a lot of recurring themes of, you know, those intersection points of why people are really after Mr. Mortimer or why people are after Dwight, uh, the young boy. And a lot of it revolves around you know, that hate, that fear, the uncertainty, uh, the otherness of people. And, uh, and, and I, and it comes into then, you know, a lot of nurture versus nature, you know, do people, are people born with that type of a hate? Is there a certain pureness? And I think that's one of the things that we really highlight with Dwight's characters, his pureness, uh, even though he's got some disabilities, um, just that unconditional love that he has for people. And I used a bit of a trope here where Dwight could kind of see or sense auras of people. And so he wouldn't see people for their color, so to speak, you know, the race as we would think of it, but he sees them for their human color, you know, their yellows, their reds, uh, because he, he can sense their heart. And, uh, and then as, but Dwight, you know, seeing his surroundings around him, you know, he wants to change. He wants to be, you know, quote unquote normal. And, uh, and because of the types of genetic capabilities that Mr. Mortimer has and, and how he can regenerate and stuff, you know, there's an interest in him being that super power type person. And if he does have that, what's going to change? And I think that's a lot of what I am hoping to bring to the reader is, you know, to think about those things. But in the meantime, um, there's some pretty harrowing stuff, and I, I hope to, you know, scare the hell out of people, too, for a good, you know, thrill ride. Well, what brought, what brought you to write this story? And I don't mean horror in itself. I just see that um, there there's quite a bit of meaning 
to this story to you and and what you're putting down here and what you're talking about the subtext is almost the uh the driver in in the story so um was there a reason you went to this type of a of a of a story yeah i think there was i think uh you know i think all of my writing are you know a little bit cathartic in one way or another and uh i did grow up in a neighborhood that was um very mixed predominantly jewish with a lot of holocaust survivors um and uh you know everybody just kind of was was very accepting uh that being said um i was bullied uh quite a bit in my in my young age um not for any particular reason, just because I was, you know, that person downhill. And there was another guy who was you know, further down the hill that uh, I was a bully to. And uh, actually, that's who I, I dedicated this to. Uh, he's since passed. Um, but a kid that I went to his bar mitzvah before, and not, nothing that I, you know, ever bullied him over was for uh, being anti-Semitic. It was just, you know, the weaker type of a person. And uh, But, yeah, he was really a, a good individual. Um so I think there's a lot of reflection on just, you know, how we bully people, why we bully people. And that can be interpreted or misinterpreted as, as hate. Um, at the same time, there's a lot going on, you know, in this world that's around us. Um, I've, my, my, my wife is, is Indian. Uh, my kids are mixed. Um, so I see a different side of that sometimes even than others do. And yet, because I'm not, um, I miss a lot also. So I think that was part of it. Um, you know, you just, I, I think you just kind of reflect on what's going on with the world around you at the time. And I think that, you know, as, as I continue to keep opening up my heart and hoping other people do the same, you know, you read the news and you find that there's so many people that are, you know, not so. Um, and the rise of, you know, more of the Nazi movement and, uh, and acceptances for hate and, and, um, discrimination and racism and stuff like that. I, you know, you just, you just wish it would go away and it, and it doesn't. So there's, I think, so much of the question of is it only rearing its head because of social media and certain political players in place and, 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 you know, mouthpieces out there. Um, or, you know, is there something that's stirring it more back up? And, and so I think some, as, as, as I'm doing some of those reflection, I wanted, you know, throw in some little pieces too for people to think about, but yet not to be so over it where it's like a, a preachy type of a thing. I just wanted it to come kind of organically, maybe for some reflection. Well, I mean, I, like I say, I've read it and there are, so, there are a lot of themes, I will say culture, um, thematic elements. I can almost see this being a textbook a book to read in a school. Is that, in, is that anything in your mind as you were putting this together, something that people would read? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I've got three kids, uh, two of which are in college, and uh, one of them's in high school. All of them thrive in environments where they're reading a book that they can discuss in class. And there's no right or wrong answers, you know. It's just kind of talking about those various themes. Uh, I did make a conscious effort to not use a lot of foul language like I would have in the past. I think there's only one F-bomb in there, and I, I wanted it to be in there just so it would sound so much louder. Um, but, yeah, I think that I thought this could be the type of book that you could bring into a junior or senior level classroom um, for high school or even like a, a freshman uh, reading class in college because I thought it's, it's a great topic for debates. I think it's awesome for book clubs. Um, there's just a lot that you can talk about and maybe never arrive at a conclusion, but just to have discussion. I think that's what I really intended for it to be. Is it's, a, it's a starting point for some discussion. But in the meantime, you know, it still gives those thrills that it keeps you wanting to read it. Well, have you thought about creating your own reader's guide and putting that out with the book and maybe that will generate some educators to take a look at it? I No. Um, I never even thought about a reader's guide to it. And quite honestly, with, you know, how it, how it came about. Um, I don't know that it has the uptake or swell yet uh, to generate that type of an interest. I, I found that in going to a lot of publishers, um, it was kind of some, some really unique feedback where people would say, this is a really timely book, but I don't think you're the person to tell it. Um, I had other people to say, ah, I'm not, I, because I, I was not, of the same type of characters. Um, 
And so I think there was another side of it, which was uh, this is a little bit too provocative for us to take on. Um, and so when I ended up going with a smaller press that was just, they believed in it and they thought this was very timely, especially, you know, this is set in, in Skokie, Illinois. So um, a, an area that is still dealing with a lot of anti-Semitism and um, um, uh, what, what, graffiti and stuff and just, you know, hate talk and, and that. Um, it's happening re right now. And so they, you know, the, the idea was let's just get this out into the wild right now for people to read. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of marketing push behind it. And so I think that, you know, as we talk about what could potentially come about for, you know, school or something like that, again, it's, it, it's got to organically grow, I think, because I just don't have all the resources to continue to push it out into the market like a, a big publisher would. Did you have any problems um, getting into the minds of the of the bad characters, the one that the ones that do have problems with, um, you know, people that they don't see as themselves, you know, racist or anything like that, and and getting into uh, a dialogue or writing that kind of a person? Mm, not too much. I think I think through just reading enough seeing enough out there and, and, and maybe that does go back to some of the thriller side and, and even what I dealt with in the intelligence community and, and you know Joe can probably relate to the same thing there's there's people have beliefs because a lot of times that's what they're just grown with and and so when you think about uh, or you re even read uh, a lot of the Nazi trials um, they were following orders, they were following their culture, they were following their people, their friends and stuff like that. And it's not an excuse by any means, um, but that's what they're consistently indoctrinated in. And so I think to remove your mindset, which is what we were taught in the intelligence community, to immerse yourself and put yourself in that culture, put yourself in that environment, what would they be thinking? What is their stimuli? Um, I'd created a model of this uh, for action based on uh, social factors and, and, and psychological factors, et cetera. So it's pretty easy to say, okay, what would this person be thinking and try to put myself in that? And, and I think that's where some of that historical stuff comes out. But again, tried not to put too much of that into it because I didn't want to make it like a, 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 a race and a fully hate book. I, I did want to tell the story and the story about this boy. Um, so I think it, because it was a little bit more subtle, it was a little bit easier to do. So hopefully I pulled that off. Yeah, at the end of the day, uh, you do have a subtext here. You do have something you want people to take away from the book. I, d I do. Um, you know, and I, and I think it's, I, I don't know that it's easy to do. I don't know how anybody does, but it's that return to unconditional love for mankind. Um, the the acceptance of people as individuals and um you know no matter what they look like no matter what they think about you know can we judge them on who they are as a character and that's why i brought in that whole aura aspect um you know the people including mr mortimer uh, you know had really dark auras those were not good people maybe those weren't things that could be changed um people that you know, might look different, but they had that same color. They were all yellow or they were all kind of a bright red. Um, you know, those were people of the same ilk. And, and so if you could really see inside people or see on the outside of people for that aura of who they were as individuals and their true spirit, um, you know, I think if you can be kind of mindful of that, sometimes you can put away, you know, differences of opinions and politics, you know, social aspects, what have you, if you just know, hey, that person is kind of good at heart, um, and maybe that's a starting place. There's a lot of subtext and detail and research. How long did it take you to write this thing? It took me about two years, but I wasn't at it all, at all the time. So, I, and, I, and you know, that was kind of a, a cool thing about it, too, is I wasn't on a deadline to, to knock something out in like nine months. And... I thought that was what made one of my last books not as good as it could have been because it was kind of rushed through, didn't get a chance to do the research. There's a lot of time that, you know, I could just go for a month not writing and just thinking. 
about the story and what was going on and take what's going on around us and add a little bit of that in the kind of pepper it. So, you know, I, I just took my time to be aware, be in the moment. Um, one of my great friends from college has a, um, has a son with special needs. Uh, he has down syndrome, uh, Jack, uh, love this kid. And he's just the most loving, wonderful, you know, human you can, you can imagine. And, uh, just on occasion, I think I spent probably two, three different times with, with Jack and his family as he came into town. Um, and, and, you know, Jack just running up and giving you the big hug. So there's a lot of like Dwight in that also, um, you know, we never really get deep into what, you know, Dwight's uh, challenges are um, and where they all come from and what you could attribute. Cause it really doesn't matter. Um, but what I did want to, hone in on is the fact that he just has that love and uh, and i think through that you know that superseded any of the research because i think when that part tugs at people's emotions um you know for either fear or anger or what have you um you know uh, dwight is is a real human experience that's not research you know trying to say okay here's are some traits and let me put this in and let's put these descriptions in you know that thought pattern the words that he does say the things that he does do that's just that's just what you capture by observing and being with individuals like that which character do you find yourself to be in this book mm. or the most of you uh is in i suspect i suspect uh mr mortimer Really? Um, because I think we're, because I think what you find, especially in the end with some reflections, you know, he's a little bit alone, um, a little bit of a, a victim of some of his circumstances. Ultimately, what he was doing, he thought was right. Uh, he was a protector uh, by nature. Um, sometimes I think he could slip up and maybe exploit a situation to his own good. Um so I think, to be honest, if there was anybody in there, I think there could have been some of those, some of his <laughs> more redeeming sides might have been to me. Uh, maybe some of the darker sides or maybe some of the things that I, I you know, can even struggle with. Well, let's get some detail here. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Mortimer is a creepy guy. <laughs> yeah. He's got a, he's got a, a weird uh, menu uh, for his, uh, uh, in the book. Food menu. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and and that's that's also kind of an interesting thing too, because I think the uh, the vampire enthusiasts love seeing something that is less um, monstrous, supernatural, but can really understand how scientifically you would need to feed on marrow, uh, feed on stem cells um, to regenerate. I mean, that we're dealing with that right now with research and, 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 you know, human physiology improvements, superhuman stuff. I mean, hell, there's a whole, the whole Marvel, um, world is based on a lot of that stuff. If you think about Wolverine, Captain America, a red skull, a lot of that took from some of those researches. And I don't think they really ever got into the depth that I've gotten into here as to what actually from a genetic standpoint you do. And I don't have any like gamma ray bullshit or anything like that in there. Um, but it's the real experimentation that science has built off of. And I think even then cast into some of that question too of, you know, what are the benefits that we as a society have today as a result of human experimentation? You know, you feel pretty horrible about some of those stuff, even taking like a, a bare aspirin. This book in itself, compared to the other ones you've written, um, it, it, did it have more of an effect on you? Do you do you find that it's changed you more than than some some of your other books? I think what I like about it is it wasn't just to shoot you in the face book. And even though it's horror and I do have the, the satisfaction that I did want to scare people and put them through a thrill ride, I think I'm most proud of this book um, because I think it does give something back a little bit or it does, um, it has purpose. It doesn't have just entertainment factor. I think, you know, the intelligent stuff and that, sure, I can educate people on IRGC or money laundering or whatever, but, you know, can you really use that? So, you know, I think looking back, it's like, was that more show offy of, hey, this is what I know that you don't know? Um, because who's really going to build front companies? Who's going to do that? But you take a book like this, and if you can, 
enrich your life a little bit different, see things a little bit of a different perspective. Even if the only thing you walked away was to understand that there were over 500,000 Romani who were also killed. The gypsies were nearly wiped out of Europe. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we focus a lot on the, the Jewish side of things and, and even some of the Poles. But how often do you hear of the Romani and even where they are today? You know, still very nomadic, uh, don't always have homes, don't have registration, stuff like that. And so they're easily mar marginalized. So even just to bring a little bit more attention to um, to a group that is still being marginalized is, uh, I think, I think worthwhile. So did, did, did this book have enough impact on you that you want to do another? Well, I it, I'm not going to build this into a series with uh, Mr. Mortimer, um, but I do have another one that I am thinking of right now. Um, I'd say not as heavy of a theme. I was thinking of something of cross-border immigration um, in kind of a unique light. Um, so, and, and about territory and trespassing and, and I, I, that's, that's the next endeavor. Now, how that comes together, I'm not exactly sure, but I don't have a problem with not writing that right away. I think just like I did this one to sit back and marinate on it, um, is good. I think a lot of times readers are so, or writers are so quick to say, well, I want to do this full time. Well, I don't have that luxury. Um, uh, but maybe the luxury is that because I've got another full time job that I have to be focused on. I could take a little bit longer on my writing, think about it a little bit more, putting it out there. So I'm not just phoning it in like, you know, maybe some other readers or writers are forced to do because of their deadlines. Um, let's put some more thought into it. And I think, you know, even the writing craft, I think there were certain things. I, I, I I'd had a conversation with Joe not too long ago where I had a couple passages that I had written in notes and uh, I was rereading them. I'm like, well, Sometimes I just take bits and pieces of something that I've read and I put that in for a note and I'm looking at that. And I'm like, I don't think I wrote that, but I wrote it some time back, but I thought it didn't even sound kind of like me. So as I was incorporating it in, I was going through all kinds of this plagiarism, uh, uh, review software and stuff like that because I'm like, where the hell did I get that? Um, because it just felt like so from the heart, I didn't know where it came from. But, and I think that by taking more time, you'll have some of those moments where, you know, maybe, maybe I put that down after having a couple glasses of wine. And I just, you know, just, yeah, this could be kind of a thing. I was just thinking of this and I wrote it down, uh, and then just didn't even look at it for another month or two. And I think to have that. How much, how much did you drink? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you. It, We're back to the drinking topic. Yeah. I mean, look, there, i we've talked, I think we've talked about that before. I mean, there, when I first started writing these thrillers, I was, you know, traveling. And so you'd go out to dinner and you'd have a few drinks and, you know, you're writing and you're writing late and you're still having a couple more drinks. And there's some stuff that I, I, I didn't remember exactly writing, even though I wouldn't have like blacked out, but just keeps those creative juices going. And so every now and then I think you probably have a couple of those moments where, you know, you loosened up the inhibitions and you started free writing where it wasn't, you know, word choice. It was just a flow. And, uh, and then you can kind of look at that later and you, it captures your heart more than I think the, the, the actual act of just writing and putting some words down. Well, let's go with that too. Um, I've read all your stuff and there's a different style kind of writing. I mean, the thriller stuff is bang, bang, shoot them up, short sentences, let's rip. This has all the stuff you would think of that descriptives. Yeah, the atmospheric. Yeah. Atmospheric. So tell me how the, you got into that or how did you make those changes or whatever it is that you did to go from bang, bang to, uh, to spooky or, or to the atmospheric part of it. Well, as you know, when I got into the bang, bang, I didn't know what I was doing with that either, and I thought I could, um, and I had to figure it out. This was the same thing. I was like, oh, I could just do this. And then I'm realizing I need more atmospherics. And as I would, you know, hand this off to various editors or, or uh, beta readers or something, I'm like, hey, I need more atmospherics in this. I didn't, I purposely didn't want to bog it down to be this 500 page novel. I think I, I still wanted it to be a little faster read. I think there's a lot of people that just want to read but don't have time. Um, and so to, to be able to get through a book in a few days and enjoy that, you know, I wanted to keep this at about 50,000 words, which is like the limit for a novel. And, um, but still have enough atmospherics that you could feel it, but that you didn't have like five pages of 
you know, history of the wallpaper or something in this haunted house or this, you know, as the, 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 the leaves, you know, blew across the lawn for like five pages. I, I didn't want to get to that depth, but to create that mood, it, it, it took a lot. And I think that of all the books that I've written, you know, all being now this just six, but of, of any of the books that I've written, this is probably the one that I had to reread and rewrite the most to just kind of keep going back in there, you know, so I had the initial paint by numbers and then I kind of painted it and now it's kind of like smooth out the lines. Now it's kind of blur this, blend this a little bit, add a little bit of flair there. So this book, you know, in, even though it's a shorter read, I think it probably had a good seven, eight, 10 layers of write, rewrite, repolish, recolor it, uh, to get it to where I think it needed to be. So really it was a contender in the space. So it met what people would expect of atmospherics. It would met, meet, if not exceed, I think some of the scare and fear factor, but then add in this new kind of tempo and keep it a little bit short. And even though, you know, we could probably look back at that, the book and say, well, I'd like to have learned a little bit more about Mr. Mortimer, you know, when he was fleeing Poland or when he was actually killing all these Nazis, you know, and if we could have had a few more of those, yeah, we could have, but it really wouldn't have been the same story that we wanted to tell. So, um, like I said, this book was written, but it was also engineered and then it was really buffed, um, to, to, to get it to where I thought it needed to be. And I, and I hope, you know, I hope enough people will read it because I think it's something kind of special. And I think it's really something kind of innovative and unique, um, still within that genre. Well, let me do, let me do an instant review. Um, the, so I actually said to myself, well, there's a, you know, you have a gap. You basically got World War II to present day. And I'm like, oh man, how did they, you know, all this stuff and he's working for these guys and he's doing this. And, and I say, I really would like to know that. But then I, Real, I caught what you were doing. I was saying, if I got that, then all this other stuff, the present day stuff, which was really focused and important, uh, would be lost in this historical fiction stuff. And so I think you pulled it off for me. And it's a short, it's a two day, three day read. And I, so I, I commend you for doing that kind of, you know, what I call getting rid of the purple haze kind of stuff and, and focusing on those major thematics, you know, the love and consequences and retribution and, purpose yeah i i mean look if i had the time and if enough people ask for it sure we could always write a version two of it you know that that adds more to it or have a second book that talks about you know the background kind of like in silence of the lambs you know you had that background of hannibal and going back to his youth and all that yeah we could always pop one of those things out but in the meantime you know hoping people will enjoy this and and, and really embrace it for what it is. And then if we have to go back to some of the other stuff, you know, eh, can add that in. It's not a problem. Yeah, this is, it's fine. Well, when you go back to writing, uh, the spy sort of action adventure, do you, do, do you think you're going to be writing different now? Does, has this opened up kind of a, um, a new type of writing, um, especially because of the, uh, you know, your, so many more descriptions going on. Maybe a little. Um, maybe not because here, here's the thing. I mean, the bottom line is it's a pain in the ass to keep submitting to professional review. Um, and the, the, the stories that I was writing, I mean, they, they sold books, but I think it was still under like 10,000 books. So it's not like I'm making, you know, billions and say, ah, you know, this is, I just, I just have to get lawyers and just figure out a way to do it because it's, you know, making people happy and it's making money. Um, it's not. Um, so there's a lot of people who like it, but it's not a massive amount where I think I need to say, well, let's keep chasing this because if it's not working, it's not working. Maybe I'm meant to do something else. In the meantime, I've been writing for this, uh, tactical magazine. They wanted to create some short stories. And so I took one of the characters, Drake Wolf, my main one from Task Force Orange, and I'm doing these vignettes of about 1500 words, um, in like four, uh, segment series. Um, what that's doing is that's really improving my writing for like a chapter by chapter to keep it innovative where you kind of recap and then you kind of leave it on as a cliffhanger. So that's kind of helped some of the horror. In the meantime, I think some of the horror writing that I have done has talked about or has helped me with 
um, economy of words and, and purpose. What do I want to achieve in a chapter or in a segment? And so being a lot more mindful instead of just kind of free writing and here it is, now I've got 3,000 words, but if I have to keep it 1,500 words, then that's really important. And so I think by having new training now uh, in doing that discipline, it's crossing over so that if I write a chapter, it's like, what's in that chapter? Is that chapter really meaningful? And I think I walk away from both saying this magazine issue, it's telling exactly what I want to say, nothing more, nothing less. When I write a chapter in the horror, it, there's a purpose. It's not backstory. It's not all kinds of crap. There's a purpose for it. And if you read it three years from now, six years from now, you're going to get something out of it that you might have missed because it's chock full of everything that needs to go into that chapter. So now, how do people find JT? Are you um, active on social media? Do you have a website? Do you have, uh, are you on hookup apps? Like, where, where do people find you? And I'm all, I'm all over the place trying to spread the word. So anything that you can find is, is under JT Patton Books. So Twitter, JT Patton Books. I think Instagram, JT Patton Books. Um, I think I got a promo video on TikTok. Um, the books right now are being released through Amazon because that's just one of the best distributors right now. Um, so, so you can find both the, the paperback and then the Kindle. If people are reviewers, you can find them on all the like book bubs and net galleys and all that type of stuff. Um, so it is out there in the wind. I think all you have to really do is Google whispers of a, of a, of a gypsy and JT Patton and you'll find it. My website, uh, jtpattonbooks.com. And of course, we'll have all that up for people so they uh, can find you. Easier. One click. They don't even have to look. So, you know, I mean, you know. I was, what kind of what kind of um, reaction do you expect? And do you, do you care about the reviews or opinions? Do you follow that up or do you stay away from those? No, actually, um, I think in the past I, I didn't pay much attention. In this one, I'm paying attention to it, well, largely for the fact that I don't have a ton of them, uh, reviews coming in just yet. I mean, it was just released. But I think what I'm interested in is less about the me and more about what did the re reviewer feel. And in the reviews that I've gotten so far, I've gotten exactly what I was hoping for. Somebody said it scared the shit out of me. It made me think for a few days. I sat there in shock for a while, and I want to go back and read it again in a couple of months just to see if if my thoughts have changed. And and that's all I can ask for because I think is for the first time it wasn't just writing a book for the sake of writing a book, but I felt like there was a little bit. I'm not patting myself on the back or getting a big head, but I I think there was a little bit of a an art form to it that I was hoping people would see. And so I think when you get that review, I think what I'm hoping for is someone is to almost say, hey, thank you for seeing me and seeing what I was trying to do. Um, and I think it's been edited enough time where some jackass isn't going to just say, I have a few typos and blah, 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 so I'm going to give it three stars. I, I don't think I'm going to have that. and I'm not going to have anybody saying, uh, that rifle really wouldn't have hit somebody at 750 yards. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think... I think if somebody's critiquing my work, it's going to be critiquing me, and uh, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, they'll they'll be saying that you're some sort of uh, you're some sort of conspiracy. They'll come up with for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're mass killer. Yeah, yeah, you're just uh, you're you're a plant. You you work for the CIA. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I can see it now. So, so what's next? Or like you were talking about these little things, do you have any major plans or are you just going to just kind of cruise along here? No, I think we'll just keep kind of, I think we'll see a little bit of the feedback if people like the style of writing, if they like the, 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 the length and the pacing. Um, so I'm going to be attuned to a lot of that because if I write this next book, I think the, the mindset is to also have it less than $60,000. I mean, like I said, People are, or 60,000 words, people are busy. 
and and they they don't, they can't always sit down. And if you're on a vacation, you know, and you've got kids asking you this and that, you know, you just want to get through the one damn book while you're there. You can't do that with a 500 pager or a 700 pager. Um, so I want it to be something that can be, you know, bite size in a reasonable time or even on audio, you know, it's going to take you a, just a few days, not, not weeks and months. And if I can get that done and come up with a story, I think, uh, I think, I think there's a little bit of a disruption in the industry that needs to happen. I think that that's what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah. Take them down. Well, yeah, Hey, well, and it was, so when, one thing that's curious, just, when you come up with the, the the story, what what came first? Was it your characters, or was it the actual idea behind what you were going to put these people through? Uh, a little bit of both. I think it was the characters initially. Um, my son likes watching um, The Office, and so he asked if I could name the kid Dwight. Um, so there's a lot of things that you know. It's kind of like on the list of things that he wanted in there that I kind of had to work around. This time I'm trying to work on something for my wife that she might have a little bit of an interest in. So, you know, I think the characters will kind of come naturally to it, to how it just has to organically actually occur. I can't force it too much. I think in the, in the first one, you know, there were just some, some things about it that ended up needing to be changed later because it just didn't fit with the story. It didn't fit with the mood. And so I'm, you know, I'm okay rewriting something like that if it just doesn't work. I'm not there to force it. And like I said, I don't have a deadline. So if we, if it takes an extra year for it to be good, then let's wait another year. Yeah, that's, um, it's a big advantage. So we really appreciate you being on the show. And of course the new book is Whispers of a Gypsy. And this is a supernatural dark thriller of suspense and horror. And, uh, and I recommend and yeah, and and Mr. Goldberg there read it, and he's still shaking. I, it, it, it's spooky, but it's thought provoking. That's kind of like my review. Yeah. Do do you do you still tuck in your toes at night? I don't want to talk about my nighttime habits. <laughs> <laughs> but he's drinking a lot. He was talking about taking up whiskey now. So yeah, this is what you did. Oh, secrets, secrets out. Come on. Yeah. Come on by, Joe. Come on by. Oh, yeah. That's right. You're the expert. You're the, you're the connoisseur. <laughs> it's the connoisseur. Well, Mr. J.T. Patton, uh, we wish you luck. And, again, thank you for, you know, coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks, Joe, for uh, your thought-provoking questions. Appreciate you taking the time to read that, too. Thanks. You're welcome. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.